Okay, so it's 5.30 here in, in Europe. So let me welcome Paola Giuliano, who will be with us today. So no much need to introduce her. So Paola obtained her PhD from Berkeley in 2003. She has published an impressive number of seminal contributions related to the economics of culture. If I had to pick one, it would be the, 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 the 2013 QJE paper with, uh, with Alberto Alessina and Nathan Nan on the origin of gender roles. But I've just checked today on Google Scholar, her most cited paper is a migration paper. Remittances, Financial Development and Growth with Marta Luisa Ranz, published uh, in 2009 on, on JD. And then given the, the type of crowd that is organizing this seminar series, I also want to remind that Paola delivered a keynote lecture at the 2018 Migration and Development Conference in Stanford three years ago, when we used to have this weird thing of gathering together and being together in the same room. So something that will be back <laughs> again uh, soon, hopefully. So Paola, we are really happy to have you online with us today. The floor is yours. I, just 45 minutes for your presentation. 45 to 50, and then 10, 15 minutes of, of exchanges with all participants at the end. Okay, thank you, Simone, for uh, the very nice uh, introduction. This is a joint work with uh, Marco Tabellini, who unfortunately cannot be present because uh, he's teaching uh, this time. So there is probably not much need for motivations for uh, this crowd, but uh, immigration is one of the most important and salient political issues of our times and has been also in the past. There is a huge literature on the effect of um, immigration on a variety of economic outcomes, which I'm not going to cover, but there is also a recent literature on the effect of immigration on uh, political outcomes. So most of the papers on the effect of immigration on uh, political outcomes study the short run. So there is a paper by Alessina and Coulter looking at Europe and the effect of immigrants on preferences for redistributions. And there are various papers looking at the effect of immigrants on political attitudes. And they tend to find that typically migration issues are related with movement of uh, political ideology to the right. Although Maida and uh, co-authors, they did find that it can depend on the type of uh, skills that immigrants have. The short run and the long run uh, political effect can be very different. So this paper is going to be about the long run effect of uh, one specific period of immigration in the US. And there are different reasons. One is the contract hypothesis. So it might be that immigrants arrive, there is an initial backlash. And then once uh, uh, people from the destination country start to know the immigrants, probably the perception change. Immigrants tend to assimilate to a various degrees. And then, uh, and this is what we try to understand uh, in this paper, there can be spillovers uh, of uh, culture and ideologies from immigrants to natives. So the paper look at one specific period of American history, which is the period of the age of mass migrations. So let me give you some data. So this is the share of immigrants as a percentage of the US uh, populations. The largest percentage was in the period of the mass migration, which goes roughly from 1850 to 1910, 1920. And then there was a huge decline related to World War I and the introductions of quotas. So we don't look at the recent increase in migration. So we just look at the long-term effect of the period of mass migrations. So we look at the long run effect and then we uh, look at preferences for redistributions, but also political ideology. So I will give you more detail on the data set, but most of the analysis will use the congressional election studies, which has individual uh, level data and county identifiers for uh, people in the US. And um, in terms of identifications, we will look at the share of immigrants and then we will instrument it with a shift share instrument using the intuitions that different group historically located in different parts of the US, but then there were some shocks to the connections between the country of origins and the county of destinations that were mostly related to World War I and uh, national quotas. So just to give you a preview of the main findings, so we do find that if you look at American-born respondents who today live in counties where there were more Europeans during the period of mass migrations, they tend to be more uh, left-leaning 
and they tend to have um, stronger preferences for redistributions. So if there is time, I will uh, give you a nice uh, story of this paper. So when we started this paper, I could bet all the money I have that the result would have gone in the opposite direction. So, <laughs> and then, you know, we were, <laughs> we found this completely opposite result, which uh, we try to rationalize it. And I hope to, to convince you that the story is, uh, is valid. So we find the, and I, I will tell you, you now we review quickly the literature on preferences for redistributions, but all the literature tells you that the effect should be in fact uh, negative. But since we find this positive effect, we try to understand the mechanism behind the result. Of course, the first one are a variety of economic channels, so I will give you all the details. And so we rule out the possibility that economic channels are driving the result. And so what's the story that we try to push is the following. So immigrants arrive with different preferences for the welfare states. And then over time, these preferences were transmitted to people from the U.S., which I will call native, but for natives here, I mean uh, U.S. born. And, uh, you know, as an indication that there was a transmission from immigrants to natives, we do find that the results are stronger when there is more intermarriage, when there is more residential integrations, and when there is more uh, linguistic similarity. So most of the paper look at outcomes today related to the fraction of immigrants in the past, then we try to link the past to the present. And so we did find that this desire for a distribution started in the US during the period of the New Deal. And then when Alfred Smith was one of the presidential candidates, because he was able to mobilize a large number of uh, second generation immigrants. I will, you know, uh, relate it to the literature in addition to the short run effect of um, Immigration, this paper is related to the literature on uh, preferences for redistributions. I've written a review a chap with Alesina a while ago. There is a large literature on the European mass migrations and then on the um, assimilations of um, immigrants during this period. And in terms of the long run effect of uh, European mass migrations, to our knowledge, there is not uh, uh, much. So there is a paper by Sequeira and then uh, a paper by Sebastian Ottinger and then a recent paper that I should have quoted, but I just read it by Anna Maria Mendola and co-authors who look at this period. So let me give you a broad roadmap. So I will start with the historical background. I will describe the empirical strategy and the result. I will try to zoom in into the mechanism and then a broad overview from the connections between the past uh, to the present, and then I will uh, conclude quickly. On the historical background, so until uh, 1915, European immigration was unrestricted in the US. There were more than 30 million European immigrants arriving roughly between 1850 and 1915. And the composition was slightly different. So in the first period between 1850 and 1890, they were mostly coming from Germany, uh, UK, Ireland, and the Northern countries. And then from 1890 to 1915, there were many Southern and uh, Eastern Europeans uh, and then uh, Russian. So this is, um, again, a different way of uh, looking at the data in terms of number of immigrants. This is when you see the biggest spike. And then there was a decline first related to World War I and then uh, related to the quotas. Again, if you want to see the share of uh, foreign born, you know, we often get the questions on you know, uh, how many immigrants from other countries there were in addition to European immigrants, and there were very few. So at the beginning, they were mostly again from Northern and Western Europe, then the Southern and Eastern Europe increased, and then the fraction of other countries was not very large. So, uh, Again, when we started to write this paper, we thought that the results were going to go in the exactly opposite directions for a variety of reasons. First, if you look at the literature on preferences for redistributions, the main intuition is that when you live in, in a place where there is more diversity, preferences for redistribution should be lower. And this is what the literature on immigration find in the short run. And the reasons is that People do not like to redistribute if they are surrounded by people different than them, uh, in average. So this is a fascinating book, which um, the title is It Didn't Happen Here. 
and by Lipset and Marx, and they try to understand why socialism was never a big movement in the US. And the reason is that, well, the US is a country of immigrants, and then the immigrants' identity prevented people from forming a strong working class um, identity. So, you know, if you look at immigrants, they weren't defined much more as Italians or Irish or Germans. And so they didn't create a working class identity, which was important for uh, the diffusions of uh, socialism. And then finally, again, if you look at the standard literature on preferences for redistribution, the model by Meltzer and Richard tells you that a higher level of income is associated with lower preferences for redistribution. And the paper by Sequeira and co-authors find that the historical presence of immigrants was related to a higher level of GDP. So all the intuition will tell you that the correlations between immigrations and uh, preferences for redistribution should be negative, but we did find a positive effect. You know, the other reasons would be to look at selections and uh, economic uh, characteristics. And, and again, even with the selections, the intuition would go the other way around, meaning that more individualistic people are more likely to migrate. And then individualism is uh, usually negatively correlated to preferences for a distribution. And then more successful migrants are more likely to stay. And again, the literature on preferences for redistribution tells you that if you're able you know, to go up to the income uh, ladder, then you're less likely to redistribute because if you're the poor of today and you can become the rich of tomorrow, then uh, preferences for redistribution should be lower. And, uh, and finally, you know, if we believe that the migrants uh, who move to the US believe somehow in the American dream, so the importance of effort as a driver of success in life, this again, should be negatively correlated with preferences for redistribution. So the question is then, why do we find um, a positive effect? So our story is that Europeans were more left-leaning than Americans. Uh, uh, you know, we look at their history of the welfare states in the country of origin, but you can also compare it with uh, the American frontier and the rugged individualism that was uh, uh, prevalent at the time. So in our analysis, we, you know, we are able to control for individualism using the data of uh, Sam Batsy, but we essentially construct an exposure to welfare reform in Europe. The one that they were introduced prior to the arrival of, of these immigrants, mostly related to the presence of public educations, but we also look at pension and social welfare reforms. And as a motivation, so we look at the Germans arrived before and after Bismarck, and I will show you that only the Germans who were exposed to the Bismarck reform seems to be moving the preferences of redistributions of people in the US. And so then our story is, uh, is a story of immigrants arrived with these cultural preferences for the welfare states, and then these preferences were transmitted to people from the US. Let me move to the data and empirical strategy. So for the historical period, we use the census of populations between 1900 and 1930. So we use the census to gather information on immigrations, or the demographic and economic county level characteristics. And then in terms of uh, preferences for redistribution, we use the cooperative congressional election studies. So this uh, data set has information of a uh, different measure of political ideology. I will tell you the precise questions in a second. And uh, preferences for redistribution, and it also has uh, county identifiers. So just to tell you a bit about the variations that we have been using. So this is the fraction of immigrants between 1910 and 1930 in the US. A darker color means a larger fraction, as you can see, can go up to 40% and there are big clusters. So very few immigrants in the South, a lot of immigrants in the uh, North and the, uh, and the two coasts. In terms of the variations that we are using, this is the fraction of European immigrants once we clean for state fixed effect. And so this is you know, actually the variations that we will be using in our regressions. So these are the questions that you can get from the CCS. So the questions are fairly standard in terms of political ideology. So all of them are coded for interpretation so that a higher number means uh, higher preferences for redistribution and more left-leaning ideology. 
So there is a, a political ideology going from conservative to liberal, party affiliations from strong Republican to Republican. A dummy on whether you are part of the Democratic Party and whether you voted for a Democratic candidate in the uh, previous elections. And in terms of preferences for redistributions, whether the per the respondent or post spending cut, whether he or she supported welfare spending, it was in favor of the minimum wage and in favor of financing the deficit with uh, uh, taxes that we rescale from uh, zero to 100. So this is the um, estimating equations. On the left-hand side, you have individual preferences for redistribution for a given individual who today is live in a given county belonging to a given state in a survey ERT. We always include state fixed effect and survey fixed effect. And our coefficient of immigrants are the fraction of immigrants uh, we use between 1910 and 1930 because this is important for our instrument, but we also have a specification which is uh, take all the immigrants from 1850 to 1930. So we also have a, a historical county characteristics that I'm going to describe in a second and a series of uh, individual controls. So these are the historical controls all in 1900. So we have the black and the urban share, labor force participations, the fraction of employment in manufacturing. There is no level of income, so we use a measure of occupational income score, and then we have geographical coordinate and then a railroad uh, connectivity. And in terms of individual controls, we have a quadratic in age, uh, gender, race dummies. So being black is an important determinant of preferences for redistribution in the US, marital and employment status, education and attainment, and income dummies. So the paper, I think, is now 130 pages long. So we do a various robustness check on whether to include a minimum set of controls or um, no historical controls at all. And then the results are uh, very robust if you're worried about the introduction of bad controls. So in terms of um, immigration... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Can I ask a simple question? Yes. Once you partial out uh, state fixed effect, what would be the correlation between your variable of interest and the share of Mexicans a few decades later at the county level? Uh, this, I, 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 yeah, I didn't check. Uh, yeah, I see. So your idea is that the counties that sees Mexican, it could be related to, to migrations uh, today. Yeah, we, did, we didn't check. We, we do have a right of robustness on whether everything is driven by specific counties that attract migrations. And so I will show you this type of robustness, but I don't remember the correlations with Mexican. I, I, I will check it, yeah. Okay. So in, in, in terms of the instrument, so we know that historically immigrants settled in specific counties. And so there is some uh, geographic variation in this historical settlement, but then we use a time series variations. And so essentially there were two important shocks. One is World War I and one is the Immigration Act that essentially were exogenous to uh, county specific characteristics and somehow broke the link between county and country specific characteristics. Now to be precise, this is still a cross-sectional instrument because we don't have enough variations to put county fixed effect, but we use this shock just to create some exogenous variations. So essentially, this is how the instrument is uh, constructed. So it's a live out um, instrument. So alpha is the share of immigrants from a given countries that lives uh, living in a county C in 1900. Then we look at the number of immigrants coming from, let's say, Italy, who entered the US between uh, T minus one and T. And then, you know, we sequentially predict from 1900 to 1910, 1910 to 1920, and so on. And then we take the average divided by the 1900 uh, populations. So we do a robustness with a different instrument, but essentially the instrument does, the, the, you know, the first stage is essentially equal to one. And so basically the OLS and the two stage least square are essentially um, identical. So we do a variety of um, robustness checks because for the IV validity, uh, so the uh, immigrants and claims must be uncorrelated with 
migration pattern from 1910 to 1930. And in principle, they should be uncorrelated with the evolutions of ideology later on. And again, this shock, uh, um, Marco Tabellini has used the same instrument in a previous paper. Th these two shocks, they change uh, the total and the mix uh, of immigrants, and they should be exogenous to county-specific conditions. So we do, I will go quickly on, on the robustness checks. You can find them in the paper. You can include a variety of historical control, including the immigrations before, so 1850 to 1900, if you think that everything is driven by the historical settlement. You can include the democratic vote share in 1900 as a proxy of the initial ideology of where immigrants are settled. You can control for immigrants share one at a time. We use a different instrument, so it's less powerful, So, but it still gives us a, a similar result. So you can predict immigration exploiting weather shock, uh, shocks in Europe. So this is what um, Sequer and co-authors do. And then we can control for internal migrations during this historical period. So one story is that immigrants went to places where there were a lot of migrants in general. These places were more liberal, and this is what drive preferences for redistribution. This doesn't seem to be the case. We also control for uh, the great migrations of Black from the South to the North. So let me give you the main result. So again, the OLS and the two-stage least square are essentially identical, but we do find a positive correlations between historical migrations and all the measure of um, ideology. Let me give you a few points to understand the magnitude. First of all, if you take a five percentage point increase in immigrations, this is related to an increase in democratic identifications by six uh, percent. And when you look at preferences for redistributions, you've, the result is a, a little bit smaller, but still quite substantive if you compare it to other characteristics, other determinants of preferences for redistribution. So, for example, one important determinant of preferences for redistribution is income from uh, the model of Meltzer and Richard. So the five percentage point in immigrants' share is of a similar magnitude of moving people from uh, an income of 100K per year to 10,000K per year. And probably the most important predictor of preferences for redistribution in the US is race, in particular being Black. And so immigration is equivalent to 40% of the effect of uh, race. So now the literature in the short term finds exactly the opposite effect. And again, even the theoretical model will tell you that the result go in the opposite effect. So then the questions that we had uh, for this, so I think the main novelty of the paper is to show that the correlation is indeed positive, but then we we have to understand why this is the case. So the first is trying to rule out the um, economic mechanism. And then we try to show that there could be a cultural transmissions, but unlike all my other papers in, in which I look at cultural transmission among immigrants, here I look at cultural transmissions from immigrants to people in the US. Uh, um, sorry, one quick question. Yeah. So yeah. The identification in all these regressions that you show is really comparing different counties, right? So, it, well, it, at the end is the share. So yeah, well, so it's going to yes. be a continuous, but it's it's like a cross-sectional comparison, right? Like yes, it's, it's a cross-sectional uh, some, comparison. Some counties for historical reasons yes. and yeah. Yeah, 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 than, yeah. Than Oh, counties. Sorry, I thought counties. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a cross-sectional comparison. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Counties. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I would skip. Um, a series of other robustness check, I already discussed most of them, but uh, you know, I, I'm happy to discuss more if you have uh, some concern. I, I want to spend more time on the mechanism and then on the historical link between the past and the present. So if you think about economic channels, so the first one would be income. Again, this is the Meltzer and Richard uh, model of preferences for redistributions. The model will tell you that higher income should be correlated with lower demand for redistribution. The paper that look at the effect of historical immigrations on income is a paper by Sequera and co-authors. 
and they did find that um, historical immigrations is related to higher level of income. And so again, should go in the opposite directions. Then we look for all the economics observable characteristics that we could create using census data. Literacy is one, a measure of skill and occupation is another one, and ability of speaking English is a third one. And then we also look at uh, Abramisky and co-author, they do have data on intergenerational mobility. Again, from the literature on preferences for redistribution is important to control for it. And our result, I mean, you can see that the coefficient is uh, very stable and robust. So for the immigrants um, selection, we cannot control much. I mean, the intuition will tell you again that the correlation goes the other way around because successful immigrants are more likely to stay and because more individualistic people are more likely to migrate. We just added in the last version of the paper a measure of the frontier by Sam Bazzi. So Sam Bazzi shows that individualistic people move to the frontier. So it's the only way in which we could control for individualism and then controlling for the presence of the, the frontier doesn't kill our result. So then what we think is going on is that immigrants have right with different preferences for the welfare states. So in, in average, they were probably more left leaning than Americans. And then over time, these preferences were transmitted to people from the US. So I'm going to show you a variety of results. First, I think we, it, it helps with the intuitions. Uh, we'll compare the effect of Germans in the US who arrived before and after the Bismarck reform that happened in 1884. So this was the first compulsory health insurance reform in the world. And our story is that, you know, the one that were treated with the reform should matter for transmitting preferences to redistribution to people in the US. And then we do this more uh, systematically in the sense that we construct an index of exposure of uh, welfare reform at the county level, looking at the number of years that immigrants were exposed to that specific reform. So we'll give you the year of the introductions in a second prior to their arrival um, uh, in the US. So we always control for um, immigrants arrived uh, before uh, 1900. And then finally, we also see whether the exposure to reform is a good proxy for preferences for redistribution. Essentially, what we do, we look at the European social survey data. So these uh, uh, data set contain information on preferences for redistribution of immigrants today. And we see whether immigrants who were exposed to their country of origin, uh, to different type of welfare reform, have stronger preferences for redistribution. So it's a validation of a, essentially of our proxy. So let me start with the Germans. So these are the uh, 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 previous left and side variables on ideology. And now we regress it on the share of Germans arrived before 1850 and 1880. So this is prior to the Bismarck reform. And then the Germans arrived after. And what you find, so these are in uh, square brackets, these are beta coefficients, you find that only the Germans arrived after the welfare reform have a positive effect and move ideology to the left. And uh, this is true for uh, uh, ideology, but also preferences for redistributions. So we control for the observable characteristics. So the two groups were very similar for the characteristics that you can get uh, from the census. Again, this is just indicative because it's an important point. It helps with the discussions. But then we do it uh, systematically. So there is a book by Flora who look at the introductions of welfare reform. So these are the reforms. Educations and pensions are the one for which we have the largest coverage. And they also cover the period of time that uh, it's prior to the arrival of uh, immigrants in the US. And so we construct different measure, one including education and pension, and one including also injuries and health and unemployment insurance. And so this is the index of uh, social welfare reform. Again, MAP helps uh, visualize. And so uh, the darker color means that 
you were in a counties in which immigrants were exposed to welfare reform in their country of origin. We do two type of uh, regressions. One, you can include the immigrant share and then the exposure to welfare reform. And so, and unlike all the other characteristics, this exposure to welfare reform has a positive and strong coefficient for um, ideology, but also for uh, preferences for redistribution. But probably the most compelling exercise is you split the sample in which you have uh, exposure to welfare reform above the median and below the median. And so essentially you find that the effect is mostly driven from those countries in which there were immigrants who were uh, you know, strongly exposed to welfare reform uh, in their country of origin. So Hello, the, can, I, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yes. I, I don't know, maybe it's maybe you're getting to it at some point, but yeah. I'm just wondering to what extent can you say how much of this is from immigrants kind of bringing their own kind of norms and preferences to a location and kind of create, I, I mean, I'm wondering if you've done anything, for example, I think it would be interesting to look at kind of saying kind of new immigrant locations, like on the West Coast, which was based. So for example, I lived in Seattle. That's where I did my yeah. PhD. Seattle, is a, everyone knows Seattle is a, was a city that was settled by Scandinavians. Not that yeah. it was really because it was really not, almost nothing there beforehand. And then yeah. most, most people, I mean, whether it's true or not, the anecdote is that they brought their Scandinavian norms with them, the more collectivism. And then of course, then kind of created a collective environment that then attracted yeah. Americans who were interested in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't, can you rule out kind of this, I mean, can you kind of say this channel of how much is from the immigrants themselves and how much is from maybe the selection of natives into those areas or changing the natives themselves? I mean, I guess Ooh. those are three channels. Yeah, so th yeah, this, this is a good question. So, so uh, okay, so to rule out the, so one could be just the immigrants, right? But then we say, well, look, is uh, the immigrants, but then the, the exposure of the immigrants to the welfare reform. So they're not like Scandinavian versus Italians. They are, you know, Scandinavians who were exposed to the welfare state or not. So the German would be an example, right? So, you know, they, you know, they could be German because they can have certain beliefs, but then I'm interested in the Germans who were exposed to Bismarck. So uh, this is one way. And so uh, I look at the fraction of immigrants between 1850 and 1900. And so these, these fractions didn't have too much of an exposure to welfare reform. It didn't matter much. Actually, when I when I do a horse race, okay. So this is one one way of looking at it, which is not. So the selection you need to the selections we we try to rule out in a variety of ways. So controlling for internal migrations and with the instrument, and then looking you know controlling for all the observable characteristics. I cannot control for the selections in terms of ideology. So you know we were looking yeah. to political, I don't have individual level data on whether the Scandinavians who arrived were selected in a particular way, but yeah, we do a series of robustness, yeah. Yeah, because Paula, I would be worried about that with, especially with this overtime comparisons. I mean, the Germans who came before the Bismarck reforms, they came from a different Germany. I mean, that's, uh, so in some sense you could say, it just depends whether you think culture, I mean, I'm not a believer that there's such thing as German culture. I mean, I, I'm a believer that culture and institutions get developed together. So, I mean, yeah. if, I came, if I came from the 18, 1850 Germany, I came from a very, a barely, it wasn't even a country. I mean, it was a, barely a country with very individualistic stuff. After Bismarck, it became much more collective. So the people who came later might just be very different, have very different no, norms. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. But, uh, okay, so I can control, yes. So I can control for the observable. And so what you're worried is that is not the fact that they were working in manufacturing or not, is the fact that, the, yeah, this, I don't know. I mean, it's the only thing that I don't have. I mean, it's impossible in a sense to control <laughs> <Yes>. for. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. I know, and the paper's super, I mean, the, the findings are super interesting even without knowing the exact pathways, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I do think maybe comparing the West Coast to the East Coast could give you some leverage if you, ha if you haven't done this, because the West Coast cities were very new and there wasn't really a lot of, kind of, there weren't a lot of Americans living in places like Seattle or Los Angeles in the early 1900s where, you know, New York and Chicago were already very developed with older yeah, migrants. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can probably try to, I think we, we try, we, we slice the data 
yeah, I think in every possible way. I don't remember if we try the west or east, but we can we can see it. Yeah. Paula, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, a similar question to uh, to the previous one. What about special contamination between counties? So if you are located uh, just near a very important county that plays in an important role at the state level, maybe the, there could be some externalities in terms of political preferences. So if you have a big shock in terms of yeah. immigration in the neighboring county, it could affect also the, the political preferences of that particular county. Uh, can you do something about that? I think the only the, the thing that we did at the moment is uh, to look at internal migration, so controlling and things. We haven't we haven't looked at spillover effect. If this is what you have in mind, we could in principle uh, look at it. Yeah, but we did control for internal migration. So if things were driven by a specific shock in a given county that attracts a lot of people in general, then we we rule it out. Uh, controlling for internal uh, migration, but we didn't look at the spillover effect. And so this is the effect of, uh, you know, immigrants in exposed welfare state and before. Yeah, again, with the caveat that Stephen uh, outlined that, you know, they, they might be different in terms of beliefs. We don't have, to be precise again, we don't have historical data on belief. Now, this is just a validation of our measure. So we took the, because you know, exposure to welfare reform could proxy for a variety of things. So what we did is we took the European Social Survey. There is a questions on preferences for redistributions. Erzo Lutmer used it in one of his paper in which he shows that preferences for redistributions are transmitted across immigrants. So there is this immigrants bring with them their preferences for redistributions. And we want to see whether exposure to welfare reform is indeed related to preferences for redistribution, and this seems to be the case. So, you know, if here it's the correlation has to be negative because the, if the year of introduction is later on in time, then the effect on preferences for redistribution should be lower with or without the introductions of individual controls. So you can also control for preferences for redistribution in the country of origin using this index. So we did it with the historical measure, we did it with this index, and the results are very similar. So this is why we think that what we are capturing is these transmissions from immigrants to people in the US. So in the remaining 10 minutes, let me show you a few more things. One is uh, as a sort of indications that things could be driven by a spillover from immigrants to natives, we look at, we split the sample by intermarriage and uh, residential integrations. And then we also look at linguistic similarity. And so this is what we find is when migrants intermarry more with people from the US, then of course there is even here, there is a sort of mating. So, you know, uh, people who, who marry people from the US might be different, but we do find that the effect is stronger. Similarly, when immigrants are more residentially integrated, we find that the effect is stronger. And then uh, if you look at linguistic distance, you find a similar result. So linguistic distance could proxy for uh, two concepts. One is a uh, facility of uh, communications. Linguistic distance is also a proxy for uh, cultural similarity and trust. So you, you could, it could proxy for uh, both channels. So one concern that you may have is uh, you know, our story is a story of horizontal transmissions, if you want, from immigrants to people in the U.S., but still it could be a, 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 a question of vertical transmissions in the following sense. It may be that uh, preference of immigrants are sticky. So if you are from Scandinavians, you continue to believe in the welfare states. And then if preferences are sticky, and then if... Um, there is a large concentration of Scandinavian today in places that were settled from Scandinavians. This could be just the result of vertical transmissions and persistence of ancestral group. So what we do is we take yet another data set, so the general social survey. So the general social survey has some important information that the CS doesn't have. He has the ancestry of the respondents, so I can include ancestral fixed effect. And then I can also look at people whose parents were uh, born in the US and also whose grandparents were born in the US. So this is one way of testing these vertical transmissions. The other one is we take the CCS 
And then we control for the share of the county populations that in 2000 had European ancestry. So, you know, if your concern is that in Minnesota, there are still a lot of people in 2000 from uh, Scandinavian uh, ancestry, then maybe I'm picking up that effect. So this is the result. I don't have much time left. So for the CDS, uh, um, you, you can look at the paper, but this is interesting for the GSS. So we took all the questions on ideology and preferences for redistributions. We always control for ancestry fixed effects. So, you know, Adami for being um, Italian, uh, Scandinavian and so on. And then we, we do the regressions with several groups. Any US born, US born with native parents and then US born with native parents and native grandparents and the results are pretty stable. So we don't think that the result, I mean, probably there is part of a vertical transmissions, but we don't think that this is what is driving the result. Okay, so a few things from the past uh, to the present. So this is an interesting, you know, evolutions of ideology in, in the US. So each coefficient tells you the share of vote for the Democratic Party. So it's run year by year with all our controls uh, on the fraction of historical immigrants. And what you find is that there is this big spike of the presence of immigrants for the vote for the Democratic Party in 1928. So if you look at the narrative, uh, so there is a, a beautiful book by Christine Anderson. So her story is a mobilization theory story. So there was a realignment from the Republican to the Democratic Party at that time. And her story is that the Hal Smith was responsible for bringing the children of uh, immigrants into the Democratic Party that was increasingly welfare oriented. So we believe that there was this shift that had this uh, momentum when uh, Hal Smith uh, you know, ran for uh, the presidential elections. Again, this is more descriptive. What we also did, we look at uh, different programs during the New Deal, relief expenditure, public work, farm programs and housing loans. And then we regress it on the immigrant share. So these different programs have a different redistributive measure. So from the reading of the literature, the relief expenditure were the ones that were more redistributive in nature because they were going to places where unemployment was extremely high. Farm program was also redistributive, but much less so because uh, it was going to places with larger farm and so a little bit higher income. But what we find is... Uh, in parentheses, these are uh, the beta coefficient if you want to compare the result. The historical presence of immigrants was related to the presence of a redistributive program historically. So let me conclude. So we studied the long run effect of European immigration on uh, political ideology. I want to stress the, the main result because the, the result is, is new in the sense that it's contrary to what's the literature would have told you, which is the literature believes that there is a negative correlation between diversity, if you know immigrants are proxy for diversity and preferences for redistributions, we find that these correlations is positive. And you know, we spend quite a bit of time, of course, the identifications given the nature of the data cannot be her type. But our story is that there was a transmission of preferences this time going from immigrants to natives. So immigrants are right with a different ideology, stronger preferences for the welfare states. They transmit it to people in the US. And so we do, consistent with this story, we do find that uh, stronger result for cases in which immigrants intermarried people from the US when they were more residentially integrated and when they were more linguistically similar. So it's an important message for the literature on immigrations because it means that there could be a difference between the short run and the long term effect of uh, diversity. So the literature, typically, even the theoretical model, they look at the short run effect of uh, diversity on uh, preferences uh, for redistributions. Most of the paper, they look at immigrants assimilation. So we normally 
tend to study you know, how immigrants assimilate to the culture of the majority, but assimilation is not a one-sided process. So if you've been living in the US, you can see it probably anecdotally, right? So immigrants had a strong effect on uh, cinemas. So I live in Los Angeles, I like movies, cuisine. And so what this paper does is studies the same thing, not anecdotically, but um, on ideology and uh, uh, preferences for the distribution. Um, so with this, I think I'm done on time, hopefully. Thanks a lot, Paola. Yeah, it was great. So there have been several questions going, going on. So I would like to ask Michele to, to jump in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paola, for the beautiful seminar. So while, while I was listening, I just came to my mind this paper by Bandiera, Razul, Viarengo, and, yeah. and perhaps somebody else on compulsory education yeah. uh, in the US and the relationship with migration from Europe. So I was wondering whether compulsory education somehow could play a role in your project, maybe as a mechanism. I don't think you mentioned this. So I was wondering whether you put any thoughts. Unfortunately, I don't remember the details of that paper, so I cannot go farther than this. Yes, so I think if I remember, yeah, we do mention the Bandiera paper in, in our paper. And so their stories, if I remember correctly, but I, I have to look at the paper again, is uh, if the introductions of compulsory educations was related to the introductions of compulsory educations in the country of origin. And so it, it could be related that we haven't tested properly, it could be related in, in, in and consistent with our story in terms of um, uh, immigrants helped through the change in institutions. So, you know, if we arrived because there was compulsory education in, 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 in my country, maybe I push and then there is compulsory education in the county when where I move. But I don't remember the details of the paper. So this is, this is my recollections, but I will double check. Yeah, we, we mentioned it in the draft, yeah. Okay, so Johan Morras, you also had a question? Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, like, uh, so I think it's super interesting on also the, the graph that you show when, when the effects show up. And mm -hmm. in some sense, you've been emphasizing this long-term perspective, but you do in, in fact see some effects that take place not that far from the uh, big immigrant wave, right? Yeah. So I was wondering whether you can, uh, sort of motivated by this fact, whether you can do similar exercises with more recent migration waves, uh, sort of the, uh, Mexican migrants on political outcomes uh, later on, uh, and maybe, you know, related to the there culture. There is a paper they... by Anna Maria Maida and Giovanni Peri and co-authors on the effect on contemporaneous migrations on political ideology. So, uh, so they, they do study that. And I, I think the, the effect on political ideology, if I remember correctly, depends on the type of skills of the migrants. And so, so people have been studied that. And so, yeah. What you're saying is our So I'm story... saying, you know, take, take the big migration wave of the 80s and 90s and do yeah. the same exercise that you're doing with data yes. yeah. on political ideology for the 2010 uh, onward, right? Which would mimic sort of what you do earlier on with uh, sort of newer data. Yes, the, the, the thing is that we have a specific story in mind, meaning that for us, it matters the exposure to the welfare reform. And so our specific immigrants group were treated. And so then we need to look at the compositions of immigrants and then uh, we have to see their specific ideology. And so it's, it's a tricky question on external validity. So I'm not saying that it's a general message. So I'm saying that if, if I look at this huge historical arrival of immigrants in the age of mass migrations, they brought with them, which people study specifically because it was important. They, you know, they changed the level of income, they changed the industrial compositions of the country. This is what the literature tells us. What we say is that, look, they also change ideology and they, this specific group changed ideology because they had these preferences. 
Now, if I look at another historical period, it might be that they change ideology for a variety of reasons. Like in the case of Perry, they change ideology. Yeah, so it's a different, in some sense, it's a different exercise. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. I but I see your with, point. With what, what you're you say, saying, right? Like there, there is one thing that may be externally valid. Which yeah, is yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, and then there's something that it's context specific, which is, you know, like in what direction the coefficient goes, right? And so yeah. I think it is valuable to have sort yeah, of. Yeah what is externally valid, which is the full story that you're telling us, which is which I buy, which I think is super interesting. But yeah, yeah, no, I see your point. Since we see this spike, it could be that is a, a, a general message that for any big wave of migration, I see this spike and then I try to understand how it evolves over time. Okay, so now Sulin, start the show. Yes, thank okay. you, Paola, for the great presentation. I have a question about the baseline result and sort of the lack of difference between the OLS and the IV. Yeah. Um, so, so I wonder, because I've been thinking about this uh, for, for one of my own papers, namely these shift share instruments basically uh, try to exogenously predict the size of the migrant stock. But what you're yeah. interested in here is the cultural selection. Like you kind of want an exogenous variation in the distribution of, of immigrants with different preferences for redistribution across yeah. counties. And so you're not picking that up with your IV, right? So yeah. you're actually, and, and I'm not clear about what the cultural selections of, of the compliers are in that IV setting, right? So maybe there's a way to somehow get to a push-pull IV that takes into account the cultural selection side of this to to really get not just at can I exogenously predict the number of Germans in a specific location, but can I exogenously predict the Germans with a specific preference for redistributive policies to specific locations? So, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of my worry in this, and especially because it seems to translate so perfectly into into the the second. Yeah, I think for. Uh... For for the for the trans, like for the fact that the OLS and the two stage list square are so close, one possibility could be you know maybe the pool factor that have attracted the immigrants to a specific county were offset by I don't know congestion costs. So this is the way in which it has been rationalized. But I agree with you that ideally what we would like to have is an IV that you know, as the push and pull related to the cultural transmissions, we have been looking for data because ideally you want to have, I don't know, some shock to the political environment. And so, you know, yeah, we, we didn't find it so so exogenous. And so, yeah, I agree. It, it is a limitation. And then we have been looking for historical data, but they are, yeah. Okay. Maybe so something, sorry, sorry maybe a suggestion if, if, Maybe it could be something like a, I know that Sam uses something similar like distance to the frontier, something like that, which could give you some exogenous variation in terms of uh, at the county level and then combining that or I don't know. Uh, yeah, we control for the distance to the frontier because the distance to the frontier is, is a good proxy for, for the selections of individualistic type. So we didn't use it as an instrument, we use it as a control to rule out that is driven by the type of selections on individualism at least. But yeah, we can see, we've been looking for a while for some cultural shock from the country of origin, but we didn't find any <laughs> so far. Okay, so Andrea Steinmeier. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a very fascinating project. I have a question that is partly kind of conceptual, partly it's also on, on the estimation. So, I mean, you mentioned that we have we have all this evidence that this historical immigration affected the economic outcomes, affected today's trade patterns, investment patterns. So I was wondering, I mean, if these people with their kind of more left-leaning ideology were successful, I mean, they might also have influenced the level of income, income distribution, potentially other social outcomes in these places that you are looking at now where you measure the outcomes. And so I, I, the question is, how do you think about kind of these effects on the current economy and related to that? So if I'm correct, that you do control for kind of the individuals like income and education levels. Is that an attempt to kind of shut that mechanism down or 
Yeah, so I think we do try to control for, uh, one is intergenerational mobility of the immigrants, but also like the level of inequality of the county precisely to prevent for, uh, for the channel. So we try to control for all uh, or the industrial compositions, which is, uh, you know, the other paper, which is out there. And so your story is that they, they change the compositions of the county and is the change in the compositions of the county, the change, the beliefs, not the immigrants per se. So there are various measures of this county characteristic in, in, in the paper in addition to the main one. And so this is our attempt, yes, yeah. Well, and then the individual control, partially control for that in principle, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. But yes. I would say mo mostly is the, the change in the counties that you see that were related to the arrival of immigrants. Okay, so thanks, Paola. There was a question from Giuseppe de Arcangelis. Yes, uh, hi, Paola. Very interesting paper. So my question is uh, whether your results would hold also for migrants uh, who bring a different attitude. So it looks like that the idea you had is that migrants brought a sort of left-wing or progressive attitude. Would mm -hmm. that hold even in the case that uh, migrants uh, uh, would bring, say, a, a more conservative, say, right-wing attitude. Basically, what I was thinking is about South America, and the study of South America is slightly different from uh, Northern America in this case. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the question. I mean, it's an interesting em em empirical question about the, the generality of the finding, and then I, I think there are various things that one should look at. One is, so let's, let's suppose that this, this process of transmissions is general. And so I could do exactly the same exercise with a group of immigrants who were right-leaning and then look at whether there is this right-leaning transmissions. It could be that these are combinations of ideology of the migrants, size of the migrants, and whether the issue was salient at one specific time. So I, I would need to... Uh, so the way I see this paper is a combination of one historical period. So there is this transmissions that goes on from the immigrants to the migrants that was helped in the New Deal because there was a large mobilization of immigrants, which uh, uh, you know had a, a very strong effect on the ideology of people in the US. Maybe it also helped because if I look at Europeans, they probably were very similar to people in the US, at, at least some, some of them, you know, maybe the Northern Europeans more than the Southern Europeans. So it's an empirical question, so I could do it, but in principle it could happen, yeah. So in, in principle, if you're exposed to right-leaning individual, then you would see more right-leaning ideology. Over there, then the confounding effect for this specific literature would be trickier because the movement to the right would be related to other characteristics. You know, it's more in line with the predictions of preferences for redistribution. So in some sense, here all the other confounding effect would kill our story. But in principle, yes, uh, it could happen. Okay, thanks. One last question from Luigi Minale. Luigi? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Paolo, for a great uh, presentation and, uh, and the project is very interesting. I have a question that is um, related to how to think about this, um, you know, shift share instrument when we have a situation where we are trying to detect the very long term uh, effect. So, yeah. you know, if, if we show that the migration between 1910 and 1930 had an, such a long term effect, then I guess, you know, the shift that we use uh, as, a, as part to construct the instrument that are based on previous settlement of migrants. I mean, it's kind of harder to argue that there is that the exclusion restriction can hold, right? Because if, if there is such a long-term effect, then why not, uh, you know, locate or share of Germans in, in previous period, why would not have an effect as well on, on today's outcome? So is it, I mean, is that a correct intuition, first of all? And second, maybe this is not a problem in your case because those migrants who were, who, that you used to construct the share that were there like before, have not been exposed to the uh, welfare reform um, 
in, in Europe that you actually show have been introduced after 2019 uh, So maybe this specific problem that I was mentioning, it is not such, such an issue in, in this specific application because, you know, yes, they were coming from a country, but they were not uh, sort of treated in the way that you are interested in, in order to keep up, pick up those, those effects. Yeah, it is, it is somewhere in between, I would say. So the last part is, uh, is definitely correct. The reasons why we have to choose the period between 1910 and 1930 is related to the instrument, because if I look at 1850, initially a, a big chunk of our groups were not there because, for example, the Southern Europeans and the Eastern Europeans, they arrived after 1910 and it so happened that they were also treated with the, with the exposure for the welfare state. So there are some limitations of this uh, instrument in the sense that it's, not a, it's still cross-sectional. So these, these are valid concerns. In our case, are attenuated, uh, yeah, just because of our treatment in terms of uh, welfare reform, unless the concern is what Stephen was saying before, which is the one that arrived before were also differently selected in terms of uh, cultural preferences that we cannot control for, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thanks a lot, Paola. Uh, apologies to those of you who submitted a question and didn't get the opportunity to us, uh, such as Jonathan or Eli. Uh, we will send all the questions to Paola. Thanks for being online with us today, and I hope to see you in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all the great comments. Yeah, hope you to meet you in person at some point. Bye-bye. <laughs>